Argentina is set to hold pre-election primaries and the list of candidates has thrown up some surprises. Who all are in the running to take over the country? The killing of a teenager in Paris has sparked anger and protests. What is the record of the French police been in dealing with minorities? And finally, South Korea seems to have appointed a divisive figure as the Minister of Unification. How does that even make sense? We'll be answering these questions and more in today's Daily Debrief. Argentina will see vital elections in October which will select a new president to succeed Alberto Fernandez. It promises to be a fiercely contested election and one of the first stages are the primaries in August which will determine the candidates. The contenders for the primaries have been announced and there are quite a few surprises, says Zoe Alexandra of People's Dispatch who has been closely following the election. Zoe, welcome to the show and could you first tell us a bit about what the primaries are and who are the candidates who are taking part? Yes, uh, in October, general elections will be held in Argentina. These are crucial elections. And actually, before even getting to these general elections, there's an intermediary step, which is uh, the primaries, the um, open simultaneous and obligatory primaries, which is called in Argentina the PASO. Uh, this is a moment that will take place on August 13th, essentially wherein uh, the different electoral coalitions, the different parties, can define who exactly is going to be on their ticket. In some cases, there is um, a bit of an internal dispute in terms of who will be um, be the candidate of these coalitions. And also it serves as a kind of a barometer of how much does each party, what kind of support does each party have and how well will they do uh, in the polls in October? So the PASO, which will take place in August, is extremely important. And as we saw last year um, in the elections that happened, the uh, legislative elections that happened in Argentina, the PASO is not always uh, definitive. What happens in the PASO is not necessarily repeated uh, in the uh, real elections. However, it is a very good indicator. And essentially, last weekend, the tickets... Uh, and those who are going to be competing in the PASO were announced. And there was uh, quite a, a very couple of surprises. Um, on the progressive Peronista uh, ticket, it was expected that Waldo uh, de Pedro, uh, who is a son of two disappeared people, he is really from the leftist camp of Kitchenerismo, very close to Cristina. Uh, it had been announced, it was rumored that he would be the presidential candidate. However, uh, on the Twitter account of Union por la Patria, which is the electoral coalition of this, um, which is following from Frente de Todos, the front for all, uh, they confirmed that uh, this ticket would actually be Sergio Massa, who's the current uh, minister of economy, extremely controversial figure in leftist circles, that's a big upset. And at the same time, Juan Graboy, who had previously said that he would no longer be a candidate if Juan Pedro uh, did run, said that he actually would compete in the Paso against Sergio Massa to see who would get this ticket for um, what really is representing the uh, Peronista organizations, um, people who support uh, the left, uh, it's a very, very important vote. This is, of course, the coalition that is in government right now. Um, and then on the other hand, on the right-wing coalitions, we also have some interesting surprises. Uh, Horacio Larreta is uh, going to be competing in the PASO for presidential candidate of uh, Together for Change, Juntos por el Cambio. This is the uh, electoral coalition that won in 2015 under Mauricio Macri. They had been severely discredited because of the damage they caused the country. However, we'll, it will be interesting to see what happens this time around. Lareta is running with no one other than uh, Gerardo Morales, who is the governor of Jujuy, who has been kind of targeted uh, as being responsible for the, uh, for example, the constitutional reform in Jujuy, which is currently in the center of the protests which are occurring there. Uh, he also is responsible for the political persecution of political prisoner Milagro Sala. Gerardo Morales is definitely one of the rising figures in the right wing in Argentina. Um, it's interesting that many uh, progressive people, when the repression was happening in Jujuy, they said that this is a blueprint for what uh, they want to impose on the rest of Argentina. So 
uh, Gerardo Morales competing to be part of the presidential ticket for Juntos por el Cambio, and they are competing against Patricia Bullrich, who was the Minister of Security under Mauricio Macri. Uh, she also was held responsible for the forced disappearance and assassination of Sergio Maldonado um, back in 2017. Uh, very, again, a very important figure on the right wing. Uh, maybe some people will remember that before the CELAC summit that happened in Argentina, she essentially threatened Nicolás Maduro with arrest and said that if he tries to come to Argentina, uh, she would pursue um, his arrest, amongst other things. So she's a really, uh, she is also a very important figure in the Argentinian right. Um, did not, she did not suffer the same fate that Mauricio Macri did after they were in office. She has continued uh, to to grow, and uh, it will be a very interesting matchup between Lareta and Bullrich. Uh, we'll have to see what happens there in August. And then finally, another very notable ticket is, of course, the rising figure of Javier Millet, who is uh, from the Libertarian Party in Argentina. This is a party that hadn't been taken very seriously. Um, he has he's a, a a you know political leader in a sense that has extremely extremely reactionary right wing. Um, beliefs and discourse, anti-gay, anti-women, uh, believes in completely cutting state services, uh, making the state smaller, um, it, against a lot of the social programs which support um, millions of people in Argentina. Extremely, extremely controversial. It, it really represents a threat for the people of Argentina. And he has been rising in the polls. So once again, in these, he is not his ticket is not competing against anyone, but it will be an important indicator to see how many people actually mobilize behind this ticket um, in a moment of a lot of economic instability in the country. A candidate and a figure like Javier Millet, who pretends to come from the outside, who is a uh, someone quote unquote political outcast, this kind of figure, as we've seen in many other countries, actually can gain some traction. Right. Now to zoom out a bit, could you tell us a bit about the context in which these elections are taking place? We know that Argentina has been facing a very difficult time for many years now. Well, as we've been covering at People's Dispatch for the past several years, since Alberto Fernandez has taken office, once again, he won uh, in 2019 with the, uh, with the coalition Frente de Todos. This was really a response to the years of the Macri government of neoliberalism. Alberto Fernandez won with a broad coalition of progressive and left-wing forces. However, once he assumed office at the end of 2019, he took on a country which had enormous debt with the IMF, um, a debt which has been condemned internationally and nationally, um, a debt which was uh, taken out illegally and that the money, and people don't know where actually the money went, it was not spent on the people. Um, he took over country just months before the COVID-19 pandemic. And so under Alberto Fernandez, the Argentinian people have really not stopped suffering. Um, when Mauricio Macri left office, poverty levels had skyrocketed to 40%. So it's 40% of the population officially living in a state of poverty, living below the poverty line. Um, food insecurity had also drastically increased. So this was already a situation that was very, very difficult. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit Argentina, uh, you know, the, he did take a very important policy, which was of containment, of uh, trying to stop the spread of the virus, um, providing people with the means uh, to stay at home, uh, launching many different social programs. But when it c came to uh, really taking on capital head on, uh, it quickly became clear that he was not willing to make enough structural changes to really change the situation of the people. And when the um, negotiations over the IMF debt happened, it also became clear that he wasn't willing to um, take the extremely bold position they would have had to take, uh, which is to call for an investigation of what happened with the debt, is to refuse to pay the debt. Um, these are sort of the only uh, solutions that really would have um, 
had a different outcome for the people of Argentina. He has been trying to engage uh, in trade, for example, with China. Argentina has made important uh, closening uh, with China. And of course, with the, the victory of Lula da Silva in Brazil, this has also opened up a very important avenue. Uh, however, it hasn't been enough. And in 2022, the inflation rate in Argentina was 100%. Uh, and that has been very, very hard for the people of the country as they've seen their money uh, you know, devaluate in value. It has um, become increasingly difficult to live on the salaries that they have. Um, it doesn't... <laughs> It, they're, they're not, their salaries aren't able to keep up with the rate of inflation, to keep up with the rate of the currency devaluation. So it's a very, very complicated situation. And this, of course, this situation of deep discontent of economic instability means that it's sort of an open playing field for all of the different candidacies, um, despite all of the structural problems that Alberto Fernandez inherited from Mauricio Macri, now the right wing can say, well, look what happens when you left, elect a leftist president. Um, so it's going to be very, very, very difficult, an uphill battle, of course, for the Peronista coalition. Uh, and we will definitely be following this. The Paso is just over a month and a half away. It will be very, very important to stay tuned onto this um, to see what happens. How does the Libertarian Party perform? How does the right-wing coalition perform? And uh, who will stay from this progressive alliance of Unión por la Patria? Will it be the left-wing leader Gravoy? Will it be Sergio Massa? That all remains to be seen. And moving on to our next story, the killing of a 17-year-old boy, Nahel, of North African origin by the police has sparked huge protests in Paris and other parts of the country. This is yet another incident in what is being seen as a trend, with those with Arab and African origins being targeted. Meanwhile, tensions are also high in Sweden, as protesters desecrate and burnt copies of the Quran outside a major mosque, that too on the day of Eid. We are with us, Anish, for more. Anish, welcome back to the show. Could you first give us the details of the Paris case and why people are so angry? I believe they're saying that this is not an isolated incident. So could you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, so the government's line is not necessarily, they're not making any comments on whether or not it's isolated, but definitely there are plenty of comments talking about how this is uh, a one-off incident and not necessarily a trend. But if you look at uh, what has happened uh, for a year now, more than a year now, uh, since 2022, uh, there have been 13 shootings uh, and all of them uh, shootings at traffic checkpoints by the police. And all of them, or at least most of them, were, uh, you know, uh, the victims at least, were uh, people of uh, African or uh, Arab origins. So this clearly shows a very clear trend. This is something that is a jump. In last year, if you have 13, and a year before that, if you only had three incidents, mm -hmm. that clearly shows that the trend, there is a surge in such incidents. And it also clearly shows that the police in France is becoming more and more uh, uh, emboldened by uh, with the use of firearms on uh, on you know even ordinary cases where it's a you know basic traffic checkpoint, and so in such cases uh, it is you know in, in, uh, com completely uh, false to say that this is a one-off incident. But this is a very clear and growing trend, and even though this is the third case uh, this year, it clearly shows that there is a, a tendency for the police which has been, as we, we should also point out, there has been a very, uh, you know, recent uh, uh, liberalization of gun laws for police or gun use by the police. Uh, and they have actually broadened the scope of it in, uh, in even in instances where somebody refuses to, uh, you know, make a traffic stop. Uh, if a police makes them, uh, if the police orders them to, uh, can be shot at by the police. And that is something that has been used in all these 13 cases. And uh, and this clearly uh, shows that the, there needs to be a review of such laws that has that was actually passed in 2017 in a different set of unrest that we need to remember. And the current set of unrest that we are seeing where uh, the police is actually doubling down on the repression. And uh, we have seen about 150 arrests already. And uh, that clearly and there has been over 2000 battalion of police 
being dispatched uh, across Paris, uh, especially in the suburbs, which are mostly dominated by uh, ethnic minorities, mostly Muslims from of Arab and North African origins. So in all of these cases, again, uh, the victims again tend to be, you know, it's like a spiral. It's uh, where the victims uh, eventually tend to be uh, ethnic minorities who always have felt uh, quite uh, marginalized in the overall French society, but and also, you know, even uh, in its quality and even when it comes to uh, the kind of violence that law enforcement has been uh, inflicting upon them. Right, Anish, now moving on to Sweden. Now, we often think of countries in that region, in the Scandinavian region, as some kind of oasis, you know, uh, where everyone lives in peace and harmony. But actually, we do know from reports that there's quite a strong right wing over there. So, what exactly happened in this incident and what does this kind of show about the situation there? Yes, yeah, so, uh, I mean, to the credit of the Stockholm authorities, they did try to prevent uh, the this sort of demonstration that many of the, uh, the demonstrators call it as protest. Uh, they're protesting Islam for God knows why. But definitely this demonstration, they tried to scuttle it. And they did not try, uh, they tried to not give permissions to it, but that was obviously shut down by the code saying that it uh, infringes upon freedom of expression. But uh, the intent of such uh, demonstration, and this is not the first time that it's happening, uh, uh, in not just in Stockholm, but also across Europe, we have seen different kind of, uh, you know, very provocative. It's not, and it's, uh, it's calling it provocative is also uh, quite a milder term, because when we look at the kind of intent uh, and the kind of uh, caricatures or the kind of vandalism, and desecrations uh, that have happened in such, uh, you know, uh, in such similar cases, uh, the intent is quite very clearly hate, hatred towards Muslims, hatred towards Muslims, uh, definitely who are usually Arabs or Africans. So this is something that is quite evident in the in the current set of demonstrations as well. We see not just merely burning of the Quran. We are seeing very clearly, uh, you know, a very clear set of uh, almost ritualized desecration of the holy book uh, in front of the central mosque in Stockholm in, uh, at the time when the Eid prayers were happening. So this very clearly was an intended act of hate. And we need to look at it at uh, an overall picture of rising hate crimes in Sweden as well. Uh, where more than half of the, the latest report which we have of is of 2021. And in that, very more than 51% of the hate crimes, which includes vandalism of mosques, desecration of holy books, uh, you know, and, ta and attacks on people as well, and obviously hate speech and slurs, uh, all of these were targeted overwhelmingly against Muslims who are a very small percentage of the country, uh, country's population. And obviously, they are they're followed by, uh, uh, you know, the anti-Semitic version of hate crimes as well, with around one fifth of the uh, of such incidents being of that sort. Now, this clearly is coupled with the rise of the right wing, as you pointed out, the far right uh, in Sweden, not just in Sweden, but across Europe, we have seen like it is coupled with such rise in hate crimes, which are often, and when you see like uh, the demonstrations are just trying to push the envelope and, uh, and trying to, you know, mask the larger set of hate crimes that act also includes attack on women, especially. We have seen more than half of such cases being targeted, uh, where the targets are usually women of such ethnic minorities. And in all of these uh, incidents, these demonstrations are just an attempt to mask, uh, you know, and be couched in the language of free speech and freedom of expression in these countries where they really are trying to overturn in not just uh, institution, but also democratic rights of certain people, uh, be it uh, in their rhetoric for anti-immigrationism or for that matter, their rhetoric on con containing crimes and, uh, you know, all sorts of things, which often, again, uh, includes targeting uh, minority ethni uh, ethnicities and their neighborhoods and their regions. So Anish, stay back with us because we are going to another region, in fact, another country we write, we talk about here on the show a lot, you write about, which is, the, which is Korea. And we are going to be talking about the Ministry of Unification in South Korea. Now, in a move which is widely viewed as an attempt to further heighten tensions in the peninsula, the President Yoon Sok Yeol of South Korea has appointed a conservative hardliner and a prominent anti-North Korea ideologue as the new Minister of Unification. 
In a major reshuffle of his cabinet, Yoon appointed Kim Yong-ho, a well-known critic of the North Korean government, to helm this ministry, which oversees inter-Korean relations and peace process. Now, Anish, before we get into the nitty-gritty of this appointment, what is this unification ministry and why is it important? The unification ministry is quite significant and there is a similar sort of, uh, you know, a government uh, department in North Korea as well. Now, we have to remember that the North and the South were divided, uh, not just on ideological lines, but uh, because of a Cold War era battle. Uh, that ended in a sort of ceasefire, uh, and, and the war is still technically ongoing. So, in both the cases, if you look at their constitutional, uh, if, if you look at the constitution itself, uh, in both the cases, uh, both the Koreas actually claim the whole of Korea as, and they claim to be representative of the whole of Korea. And it's a very similar case that we see with China and Taiwan as well. And in this case, unification departments very clearly outlines an ideological framework for not just foreign policy, but also for future plans of how they intend such, you know, if possible, a unification or a reunification of the two Koreas as a one as one country, and how they want to, uh, you know, smooth out these functions. Uh, very primarily at the moment, and on more practical sense of the term, the this ministry. Uh, essentially handles inter-Korean relations in most cases. Uh, and it also is at the forefront, uh, sorry, the front lines of any kind of peace processes that might emerge or have emerged in the past as well. So in both the cases, you have a very clear set of guidelines being, uh, you know, enunciated by the ministry. And it is a person and, uh, at the head of the ministry who more or less kind of sets the tone uh, for how the government wants to move forward with their relations with the North. And that is primarily why an appointment like that clearly shows uh, where the UN government is right now heading towards and why such an appointment is going to be a bigger, you know, uh, you know create bigger tensions for uh, the two Koreas in the coming days. Right, Anish, so could you tell us a bit more about this new minister? What, is, what has been his record? You know, why is there such a controversy around him? Yeah, so he was part of uh, a previous uh, cabinet as well as a secretary, again, of the Ministry of Unification. And in that cabinet was uh, the previous uh, conservative cabinet that pretty much ended the sunshine policy, which was basically an attempt to, uh, you know, which was a major uh, attempt to uh, create a, a, you know, sustained peace process between two Koreas by a previous democratic government. The Sunshine policy was the biggest uh, kind of uh, landmark sort of policy uh, instance where uh, and before the Moon Jae-in government actually created a proper peace process and dialogue between the two countries. And that the ending of that was uh, seen as a major setback to the Korean peace process as a whole. And uh, he was definitely part of that entire process. And, and if you look at some of his statements, uh, in the past, recent past, some of his, uh, you know, uh, stand on North Korea, he has very, very vehemently focused uh, a part, large part of his, uh, as a public ideologue, uh, on, you know, on opposing North Korea and, you know, focusing on human rights, but more than human rights, focusing on how, you know, any kind of unification would have to be not just denuclearization, but demilitarization of the North Korean uh, state and obviously uh, implicitly meaning that a takeover of the state by force or you know through dominance. So appointing a person like this at the helm of the unification ministry uh, clearly shows uh, you know it kind of also changes the definition or the understanding of what unification would mean for the UN administration because it changes from reuniting of you know two ideologically opposed states or maybe reconciliation as well, which was always the kind of guiding, uh, you know, uh, uh, framework for past administrations, even some, some conservative administrations, uh, to becoming a more confrontational, maybe, a, uh, you know, kind of unification, which would, which might include use of force, or for that matter, uh, a dominance where the other has to be obliterated for any kind of unification to happen. 
So it, this is the kind of situation that the UN administration, and this is not new, actually. We have talked about how the UN administration, ever since it came to power, has always tried to uh, you know, push a more confrontational side. And that was, in fact, the part of his uh, election campaign as well. Right. So the whole point was to create more confrontations with the North Korean administration because uh, they essentially believe that there cannot be any kind of peaceful reconciliation with the North. And that is what a large part of these hardline conservatives uh, kind uh, do believe in, and which also form a la- significant uh, constituency as well at the ground as uh, in the South Korea. So this sort of pro-US, and they are very much ready to make any kind of concessions to uh, their pro-US agenda for that matter, even if it's at the cost of their national interest. But when it comes to North Korea, it has to be all sort of no compromise, only confrontation kind of line. And this is pretty much what the UN administration is giving signals to uh, from, you know, not just this appointment, but also from recent moves that he has actually adopted under his administration. Right. Thank you so much, Anish, for giving us, I think, a clear explanation of what's really happening. I mean, this might be one ministerial appointment, but it's really part of, I think, a larger trend which you've been talking about on this show. And unfortunately, very depressing and disturbing events coming from that part of the world continuously. And I'm sure you'll be tracking it and we'll come back to you for more details uh, on such stories as well. Thank you so much. And that's all we have time for today on this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow. But in the meantime, do go to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Do follow us on all the social media platforms of your choice and keep watching and reading.